the width and breadth of life is a wonder that borders upon the enchanted. In only the last few decades, it has been discovered that the majority of Earth's life exists hundreds of meters beneath the soil, that organisms can thrive at the very edge of scalding hot springs and upon the precipices of volcanic craters. It was learned that the trees, and indeed the vast majority of plants, are connected through vast networks of mycelia, the thread-like structures of underground fungi. And not only do these fungi exist in symbiosis with them, bringing the trees nutrients and water and receiving in exchange sugars, but they enable the trees to share nutrients among one another and exchange messages so that the foliage of a forest can function as a single, gigantic superorganism, powerful enough to moderate the temperature beneath its canopy, far-reaching enough to evoke rain. But one of the great mysteries of life is an organism that covers as much as 8% of the Earth's surface. You see them on the bark of the streamside hemlocks, here in this footage. And you see them here as well, the pale patches of crusty lichen clinging hard to the thick bark. And upon the bark of the tree closer, the foliage or leaf-like structures have yet another completely different kind of lichen, now turned a dark and shimmering green in the richness of a warm spring rain. And here, upon an outcrop of moss-covered rock, we find the foliage and fruit-like structures of yet another lichen, almost as white as snow and striking amidst the late summer green. When it grows upon the ground, it grows where the soil is shallow, almost bare rock really, producing acids that convert the coarse earth and the stone just beneath, very slowly, across the length of centuries, into new soil that will later feed the plants such as the mosses and the wild strawberries that enjoy growing among it. From an insect's perspective, lichens such as these must be like trees, tall, white, and shimmering, and for those organisms equipped to benefit, rich in food. But to me, lichens appear far more like terrestrial coral. And wherever the thin skin of earth gives way in entirety, revealing great stones thrust up from the bedrock, we find a menagerie of yet more lichens clinging to the stone and eking out at existence where no plant could. And it is their slow and patient work that makes the lives of plants possible. Everywhere you go, you will find lichens on the trees and shrubs all around and even upon the stone on which I stand. So long as the air is pure, they are prolific. In an old forest such as this, one can see the tall tree trunks are covered with them. And this is to be expected. For trees, especially together as a forest, are great purifiers of the air. And even a few square miles of healthy forest removes tons of dust and man-made pollutants every year. But what are these strange yet common organisms, lichens? If I were to begin that answer by describing them, I might say that they are everywhere, ubiquitous and prolific. I might describe them as long-lived, for some can live for centuries. I might call them survivors, for they can eat stone and live in the heights away from any land-borne nutrients, absorbing what they need from mist and breeze-borne dust. But if I were to become far more specific, I would define a lichen as a symbiotic amalgamation of two or more independent separate organisms, each of which can usually live on its own, and, when on its own, looks so different as to be entirely unrecognizable from a lichen, but which, when they come together, form a union which is so tightly bound one with the other that they become more like a single creature. And yet, what a lichen is is more complicated than that. For it has recently been discovered that many lichens are an amalgamation of three or more organisms. Bacteria, or more specifically cyanobacteria, algae, and fungi. It is the fungi that provide a lichen its structure, and its body is known as a thallus. The fungi that take part in the creation of lichen are known as basidiomycetes and ascomycetes. If you have ever studied mushrooms, even in a rudimentary way, you are already familiar with the basidiomycetes. Among the members of this group are puffballs, bracken jelly fungi, polypores, rusts, smuts, and earth stars, and the often delectable fungi, chanerelles, and bolletes. This image from Ernst Haeckel's 1904 Kunstform and depicts the incredible variety found amongst this group. The other group, the Ascomycota, contains the sac fungi, and its members contain the eerie dead man's fingers, the cup fungi, and a number of very useful and much desired fungi such as truffles and morals, 
as well as baker's and brewer's yeast. One type of fungus commonly found in lichens is the genus Termella, and pictured here is the common species Termella mesenterica, an edible fungus also known as witch's butter. And here is its cousin, Termella aurantia. This is an interesting fungus in that it appears on rotting wood, but does not feed on the wood directly. Rather, it parasitizes other fungi that are causing the wood rot, specifically the corticeoid fungi of the genus Peneophora. Fungi of the Termella genus are commonly found in wolf lichen, and it is doubtless because of their parasitic habit that it was thought they were parasitizing these lichens. New research indicates the relationship may be more in-depth than that, and that the Termella may be a third integral part in the wolf lichen. And other research has discovered that many lichens share their structures with even more species of fungi. Dictionema glabratum is important in the South American ecosystem as the lichen fixes nitrogen into the soil. Initial analyses by a team of scientists discovered that this lichen contains some 16 species of fungi, but a deeper genetic analysis discovered indeed 126 species of fungi in this single lichen. And computer models analyzing the possibilities in the various locations where it's found suggest that this lichen may contain well over 400 species of fungi. Indeed, the world of lichens is far more complex and intriguing than any scientist had suspected only a couple decades ago. Because it is the fungi that provide the structure of the lichen, it is said that the fungus is the dominant member group of this symbiosis. But the structure is nothing without its engine. And it is the algae and cyanobacteria that provide the fuel for the lichen, without which they could not exist. These tiny, chlorophyll-rich organisms take the water captured from air and the nutrients captured in dust, as well as airborne nitrogen, and combine it with sunlight to make sugars, and these carbohydrates feed the entire lichen organism. Depending on the species, lichens can be rich sources of carbohydrates, making them a prospective food source for animals such as cervids in tough times. And humans can use them as well. And relatively safely too, because of the more than 20,000 species of lichens that are presently known to exist, only two are known to be toxic, and one other is known to have hallucinogenic properties. However, this is not to say that a person can simply harvest lichen and eat it at any time. The polysaccharides found in lichens are often indigestible to humans, and many lichens contain mildly toxic secondary compounds, in particular the acids they use to dissolve stone to obtain nutrients and which eventually and slowly turn stone into soil. And among those very few lichens that are toxic, they contain vulpinic and usnic acid, which must be avoided. However, those lichens tend toward yellow. Even among the non-toxic lichens, some processing to render them fully edible will be required. Throughout history, many techniques have been developed to render these lichens fully edible. They include soaking in potash, soaking in bicarbonates, and repeated boilings and drainings. But as if by way of natural compensation, lichens are available in the summer and also in the winter when food is scarce. In trying to understand lichens, it is important to recognize that nothing really is simple about them. A lichen is not a single creature, but a composite organism comprised of two or more very different species. That alone would seem to make them strange enough. But they have evolved numerous times in Earth's history, and this repeated process of convergence evolution indicates that this is a very successful paradigm for life to take. Indeed, the profound union that we see between fungi and chlorophytic organisms that appear in lichen makes the best of what both their worlds have to offer. Fungi are hardy and very good at finding nutrients in the environment round about them. And chlorophytic organisms have the unique and highly beneficial ability to turn basic nutrients in sunlight into food. And not only can they feed and protect one another, but fungi are adept at protecting themselves from infection because they are very good at producing antimicrobials. Thus, the powerful alliance between plant-like organisms such as algae and cyanobacteria produces an organism that can weather hard times harsh environments, and withstand pathogenic infection. Many fungi do have one weakness, though. They require pure air. And because of this, only a few are found in urban settings. And for this very reason, they also serve as telltales of environmental quality. Where lichen are abundant and diverse, you can be sure the air is good. In upcoming episodes of The Naturalist, we'll take a more in-depth look at this amazing branch of life, producing soil from bare rock, deriving nutrient from the air, and perhaps nature's ultimate example of the benefits of cooperation, as well as being a useful area of study for foragers and herbalists due to their medicinal as well as food qualities. 
Lichens are a branch of life that deserves our full attention and respect. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.